studying the movements against racism in the United States that I became familiar with an anti-capitalist politics and was convinced by it. And uh, I think that it, it, it was uh, extremely central uh, to the anti-racist struggle and also um, these movements were, I think, some of the most significant anti-capitalist movements in the United States. Um, but I, as I participated in social movements uh, today, and uh, as I saw the kind of political discourse uh, that's prevalent today, that seemed to have been forgotten. And so I wanted to uh, write about uh, how central that was and how closely connected these struggles were historically and ask why that, um, that, that basic connection has been suppressed. And um, part of what uh, I think has done that is the way that uh, race has been uh, reframed in terms of identity, which I think uh, is, um, uh, it's, is an ineffective way of understanding race and the anti-racist struggle. When I talk about a critique of racial ideology, um, a large part of what I mean is that racism in the history of the racist discourses uh, from centuries before uh, had the idea that you can explain human variation, human difference, uh, as the expression of different groups, the existence of different groups uh, that are natural and are called races. And uh, the, the second step of that, of, of that uh, ideology was to say that these groups are in a hierarchy and some are superior and others are inferior. Now, most people who are part of polite society don't believe that uh, some racial groups are superior and others are inferior, uh, but they still believe that these groups exist. And I think that we have to go much further and question that very idea. Uh, it is false that human variation biologically can be explained by the existence of races. Uh, race in this sense does not exist. Uh, socially, race exists. Socially, as an ideology. Uh, an ideology is also a material thing. It's produced by material practices. Uh, so this doesn't mean that it's just an illusion. Uh, so race is real in the social sense, uh, but in order to uh, understand race without going into racial ideology, without going into the first step of racial ideology, which is the idea that races exist as groups of human beings, uh, we have to have a very different way of understanding the social phenomenon of race. And this means for me that we have to be very careful about coming up with general theories of race, as though um, across millennia and uh, all around the world in every different region, uh, there is something that is uh, the same, common, that is called race that just exists everywhere. Uh, I think, first of all, there are many different kinds of uh, social antagonisms, we may in many cases have to explain them in other ways. Religious antagonisms, uh, the idea of civilizational difference, uh, these are not necessarily race. Uh, so I think we have to be quite specific, we, we, we have to be quite specific about what race is and we have to distinguish between different instances where it appears. And so in my book I'm very specific about how race uh, is formed in the United States. I don't think you can just transpose that to another place and say, well, it's the same thing. You have to look at the specificity of that process. And uh, what, what, uh, where I differ from the idea of racial capitalism is that I think that um, we can't make a connection between racism and capitalism, or even race and class, uh, as abstractions. When we talk about racism, when we talk about capitalism, these are abstractions, they are concepts that we're using to understand a social and historical process which is a complex whole. It's not as though we can uh, look at um, 
w one, one place over here and say that this is where race is happening and in the factory over there that's where uh, class is happening. It's, it doesn't work like that. We can't say that from the 16th century to the 19th century there was race and then now there is class. Uh, so we use these concepts to understand aspects of this process, of this whole. Um, and so I think, once again, this idea of specificity or of what Marx called going from the abstract to the concrete is what we need to do. Rather than taking the whole messy, uh, this, this, this messy reality and trying to reduce it down, to the most um, uh, uh, to the most basic uh, concepts, and then explaining their connection as some kind of model, we have to take these ideas that we have in our heads of race and class and capitalism, and make them more complex and bring them back down to earth. First of all, this is a general point about race. I mentioned that I don't uh, think that it's uh, effective to understand race as an identity because uh, race isn't something that's uh, intrinsic to me. It's not part of who I am. It's the way that I am socially classified by processes that really had nothing to do with me. Um, and you can see that when you look at the formation of race across history when you understand that it's a social process uh, rather than being something that is uh, a part of uh, what human beings are. And uh, the white race is a very good example because uh, we know that um, the, the, it, it has been produced through the extremely different populations of Europe which within Europe actually were divided into various uh, classificatory systems and were existed within hierarchies in which the English were supposed to be superior to the Irish and to the Slavs and so on. How does it happen that when they migrate to the United States there is a process in which they all become white? Now that's a very clear kind of process uh, that you can see of course, in a certain sense it's clear, but in another sense it's very unclear because now we take it for granted that everybody here is white in, in the Spanish state. What, what does it mean to say that? You know, the, the, the white race uh, was invented in the United States over a process of centuries, and now we say that uh, someone living in an, another continent is white. That is racial ideology. Uh, and so we have to question that and say, okay, the white race at, at this fundamental level does not exist uh, because it is, uh, at least it does not exist as, um, as, as an attribute of people. It exists as a form essentially of social control. And uh, part of this means that the people who are included in the category of whiteness are extended certain privileges, have been extended certain privileges over uh, a period of time in US history. Um, but we should be careful about understanding what those privileges are and what their meaning is, because uh, in a certain way, uh, these privileges, they have obvious advantages, uh, but they also have a great disadvantage, which is that they lead white people to think that they are better, they're already in a better position than the other people who are not members of the white club. And a, a poor white person who um, has more in common with a poor black person may think, well, I am best represented by Donald Trump. That is a kind of mentality of white privilege. It's not very good for the poor white uh, 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 opiate addict in uh, rural Virginia, let's say. So um, this is a problem with the way that white privilege is talked about now. White guilt, white fragility, all the, this language it is a solipsism. You know, it, people think that they're being anti-racist, but they make everything about themselves 
white people end up making everything about themselves and they end up reinforcing the idea that there is something natural about being white uh, and that uh, in a kind of religious sense, they have to uh, uh, they they have to atone for their uh, for their sins, and um, I don't think that uh, the idea of original sin is a helpful one for politics. There was uh, certainly a labor movement in the United States um, and it actually had, um, it was an important site for the development of the uh, movements against racism for the de development of black movements um, because uh, there were attempts to organize black workers who were excluded from uh, the existing unions and uh, there were attempts to um, have uh, um, labor struggles that address the specific issues of black workers that were that were not going to be re uh, realized or that were not going to be addressed uh, if you just had a general worker struggle. Uh, you had to deal with this uh, special particular form of oppression experienced by black workers. But the labor movement in the United States was really crushed in a dramatic way um, that, uh, that is often, I think, hard for Europeans to understand the level uh, the, of backwardsness we have in the US uh, around this. And um, I think it's important to see that the, um, the, con the, the, the way that uh, a mass movement continued, and you know, it was largely it can be considered in a significant sense a workers movement but I, I don't want to just reduce it to that. Um, the civil rights movement was the, 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 the major mass movement of uh, the period from the 50s through the late 60s and um, so I think you know while in this period you had um, the various uh, struggles in Europe that were um, often that, that were partly labor struggles and then partly countercultural struggles and so on, but that were really um, uh, explicitly identified uh, with um, a kind of anti capitalist politics. That the civil rights movement isn't often understood that way, but I have argued that it should be. Um, because uh, you can certainly see it in um, the way that many of the major figures uh, of the movement understood the um, implications of the struggle they were engaged in. Uh, you look at Martin Luther King, um, who uh, is preoccupied with the question of justice from the beginning of his political career, and many people uh, I don't know how common this is, um, how widely known this is in Europe, but um, often in the U.S. people on the left will point to the last year of Martin Luther King's life when he made a speech against uh, the war in Vietnam uh, and uh, was participating in the what, he, what was called the Poor People's Movement. He believed that the civil rights movement at this point had to proceed to a movement against poverty and uh, the, the main focus at this point was to organize sanitation workers and to have a sanitation workers strike. Um, but he already, you know, the decade before, right when he was first getting involved in politics said uh, there's a worldwide movement against imperialism and everywhere people are rising up uh, against inequality and against uh, domination and what we are doing here in Montgomery, the Montgomery bus boycott is part of that. And uh, this was recognized actually around the world at the time. You'll find statements about this, uh, you know, by Mao Zedong. Uh, it's, uh, it was not lost on most of the world.
And so I think the civil rights movement should be understood in a much uh, more radical way than certainly it was taught to me in school and the way that it was represented uh, as just kind of a realization of American democracy. But it, the civil rights movement kind of entered into a crisis uh, because it, had, it was operating on the principle of justice as a principle of emancipatory politics and has strategy of disobedience that you have to violate unjust laws. Um, but by 1965, it had uh, led to the, um, uh, the introduction of new laws. Uh, and that became a, a kind of turning point where, where there had to be a decision about where to go next because they had focused on legal segregation in the South. Uh, se uh, the segregation by law, and uh, now they were they they had to face the situation that even if you change the laws, um, racial domination persisted, and as many of them were pointing out, black people were still poor, and you had to deal with that. And at the same time, in in the north, and not not just, but in in the north. Um, you had the urban rebellions, the riots uh, that uh, did not um, fit within the framework of uh, civil rights movement organizing. And so that's a movement, that, that's a moment where um, there is a divergence in strategies in the civil rights movement when Martin Luther King wants to have uh, an acceleration, intensification of civil disobedience against economic inequality. And then others like Bayard Rustin want to have um, uh, um, uh, go even further into making policy and changing laws and participating uh, in uh, the electoral system. Uh, but it's also at this point that black power becomes an, uh, a kind of central political uh, 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 perspective in the sense that it switches from, let's say, the idea of justice as the center of the politics to the idea of political power. So black power meaning black political power. But here too, there is a division because what is the nature of political power? They, you, this really poses the question. Um, would it be the way that you know, um, the person who really popularized the slogan uh, Kwame Ture, then called Stokely, T Stokely Carmichael, uh, he wrote a book, he co-wrote a book with uh, Charles Hamilton called Black Power, in which black political power was really about winning elections in local governments uh, so that black people could follow in the footsteps of uh, Jewish and Italian communities that had managed to build up uh, some kind of political power in a system of a kind of ethnic pluralism. But then you have the example of groups, the most famous being the Black Panthers, who are really um, posing the possibility of armed insurrection and of the uh, creation of, uh, of a kind of uh, counter power through the survival programs and so on. Um, and that is, a, that is a very important divergence. And ultimately, when um, the, ultimately it's the first strategy that wins out, uh, the, that uh, this, this uh, oppositional politics gets channeled into the state. And there you have another crisis because now, it's the politicians that the mass movements put into power who turn against the mass movements because they are imposing austerity measures, they are trying to demobilize opposition, and, um, and, and that is really a point where, uh, where it becomes very complicated to figure out how uh, race plays a role in a revolutionary struggle uh, and I think because of that 
uh, difficulty, um, that's when you start to get the displacement or what I call the neutralization in the book of the anti-racist movements by identity. The Black Lives Matter movement um, is not one unitary thing and uh, it, there have been many episodes over the course of several years uh, which have been characterized as Black Lives Matter um, and uh, they've happened in different places and sometimes they've had a spread and resonance uh, across space. Um, sometimes there's been continuity but sometimes there has seemed to be um, a sudden upsurge that uh, um, it's hard to explain why uh, because police murders, uh, police uh, racism uh, is there all the time. And why is it that you will have a moment in which uh, one instance becomes uh, the, the, the mobilizing uh, uh, force, that, that, that one example of something that happens every day suddenly becomes the point where all of the opposition and all of the outrage that people feel and all of their motivation to act uh, becomes concentrated at that point. It's very hard to know when that happens and what are its conditions. It's hard to know what are the conditions uh, that make it so that people will decide that, once again, something that is constantly happening is now um, uh, motivating me to go out onto the streets every single day for weeks, um, risk arrest, uh, and, and, and spend hours of the day in political meetings. Why does that happen? And you know, that, that's something people talk about uh, in many social movements. I mean, you, I'm sure you uh, have experienced that here quite recently and then you had it uh, in the Arab Spring, you had it in Occupy and um, one of the one of the dilemmas of that uh, kind of moment is that it's not possible to spend the rest of your life going out every night and fighting the police and then spending the rest of the day in a boring political meeting. You just can't do it. And it's extraordinary that suddenly you become capable of it for a particular period. But unless there is a kind of, um, um, uh, unless some kind of organizational form is produced that allows this to persist, that allows the politics to persist, even at times when the energy has declined, uh, even at times when the situation is not generating uh, this kind of uh, concentration on a particular, uh, this concentration of a, let's say, of a, the idea of a universal wrong on one particular uh, incident. Um, at those times, there needs to be a force of organizational continuity, but I would say even more than that, there needs to be a way to maintain the commitment to the kind of emancipatory politics I was talking about before. Um, I think there were 27 million people on the streets in the protests in the United States uh, over the summer, uh, provoked by you know this 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 one example of police violence, the murder of George Floyd. Um, but 27 million people. I am quite certain did not believe in um, the, the complete overturning uh, of the capitalist state or the entire uh, social system. And so you cannot rely on, uh, what, while on the one hand um, we want movements to expand, and you know, my book talks a lot about alliances and coalitions. Some people, especially here, have used the word transversality. I didn't use it, but it's, I guess it's all right. Um, but I think there is another side to it, which is that 
that can also be a dilution of a political dilution and you need to have a, a kind of contraction you need to also have the um, the consolidation of those who are committed and steadfast and um, uncompromising in the commitment to emancipatory politics without that I think a mass movement uh, will not become uh, a revolutionary movement. This, um, it, this contains about a hundred different questions, really. So, I mean, there are many, there are a number of, let's say, paradoxes of liberalism or of rights, and the one that Marx really emphasized was, uh, you know, early on was that um, there, there is a kind of formal equality that you get through political emancipation, that is when um, people are said to be equal in rights, uh, but in reality they are not equal because even if everyone has the right to uh, property and so on, um, most people don't actually own it, um, and so this is a th this is a basic kind of uh, a contradiction, inconsistency of uh, of liberal capitalist societies. But then there's a lot more going on because you you pointed to the idea um, that there are there there can be individual rights, and then there can be the idea of rights for a particular group. Now, this is a complicated history because um, part of the way that emancipation became a general political term, uh, because originally, you know, and we still have this, we have it in English, that uh, emancipation is about the uh, independence of a child from uh, their parents. And that's legally where the term comes from. This is the etymology of the term. How is it that it comes to be uh, used to describe the abolition of slavery, first of all, and then uh, how does it come to be completely generalized in you know, Marx's thinking and up the thinking of others to uh, the freedom of everyone? Um, well, part of it is because uh, different social groups made demands for emancipation, Catholics, Jews, women, uh, and then it was uh, applied to slavery. And Marx, uh, I think, was trying to think of something that went beyond individual freedom because he said, the, if, if you continue to call for individual rights, you end up uh, just reproducing the basic category of the market, which is what generates the real inequalities that undermine the formal equality. Um, but it's not clear what the real emancipation is. He sort of suggests in his early writings that it has something to do with um, overcoming the separation between uh, our own social powers, which are projected onto the state, and our existence uh, socially with each other. So to overcome our atomization, and to reabsorb our own powers back into the human community. This, this is kind of his original conception of real emancipation. I think that the important thing now is to uh, maintain the idea that there is a politics of emancipation of which Marxism was one moment. And uh, for Marxism, universal emancipation would be realized through class struggle. And that was the, you know, Marx essentially sets out the idea of a real emancipation that goes beyond political emancipation. And it's only after that, very, very soon after that, but after that, that he identifies the proletariat as the group in society that will achieve this. Why? Because the proletariat has no particular interest of its own. Whereas you could say that there are all these different social groups which we may define in terms of identities which will say that we have particular interests because of who we are. He says, at first, he says the proletariat just, it has no particular interests, so it will be the agent of universal emancipation. 
Now, is that equation uh, a necessary one? Uh, is it going to be true throughout history? I, I'm not sure we can maintain these assumptions. But what I think we should maintain is the idea of universal emancipation and uh, the idea that in order to achieve universal emancipation, we have to proceed not according to the idea of our own interests, either as individuals or as members of a particular group, but by, um, by studying a specific situation, a specific political situation, and determining what kind of action is necessary in order to uh, achieve the emancipation of all.